You're probably used to seeing this screen as you log into Power Apps. There's a little link down here called All Templates. So we're going to click on that to see all the templates that are available for us to uh, use. So it's uh, on my screen, it's the third one over. It says Power Apps Training. So this particular template, as you can see here, it's a training app that teaches you the basics of building your own Power Apps applications with 20 plus exercises, each one taking a few minutes to complete. You'll learn how to build your own apps in a hands-on way. So first, it sounds, it sounds pretty positive, sounds pretty cool. I'm just gonna go ahead and leave it with the unique name that it created here for me, and I'm gonna click Create. All right, this is the application that's popped up here. And as you can see, if we uh, collapse that first uh, screen here that we're currently on, we'll find that we actually have 20 different lesson screens to go through. The first thing to do, uh, as you read here at the top, says make your own version of this app by connecting to data storage such as OneDrive. Now, a lot of these application templates that you open up that you start from the uh, Power Apps home screen, um, whenever you open them up like this, you create a new one, you'll get this thing here at the top says make my own app. So we'll definitely want to do that. That's going to create a data source for us. It actually creates some good sample data for us to use in this application. All right, lesson one is easy. So it's going to tell you about the F5. So it's a toggle, it actually runs it, and if it's running, you hit F5 again, it's gonna take you out. The same thing can be achieved by clicking on the play button at the top here, and then to get out, you click on this X. So you can either do one or the other, or switch between the two, it really doesn't matter. And that is pretty much what this um, first lesson is about, learning about the F5, getting into run mode, and then back to design mode. Sort of tell you, if you hold down your Alt key on your keyboard, and then um, hovered over a button or do something within the app. It's almost as if it's temporarily running the application. So I thought I'd mention that as well uh, if you haven't already seen that tip. So I'm just gonna hold down the Alt key and click on Next. So the second lesson is just as simple as the first one. Pretty much what it's telling you here to actually use the F5 key or run it. And click on this task completed. And it's pretty much explaining once your task is done, the next button will appear and it did. So we're on to lesson three. All right, so lesson three um, describes the basics of using controls within Power Apps. Controls are visual elements that you add to your design surface here. For example, as we see here, there is um, a rectangle here. And if you select an item within Power Apps and then go over here to the upper right corner, you can see that it's actually a rectangle. You can add controls uh, by going to the top of the screen. And uh, uh, rectangles and shapes are actually hidden under icons. You probably wouldn't think of them as icons if you were to open this up and look at all the icons you have available to you. The shapes are down here near the bottom. And it starts off a circle. And then you've got all of these shapes that you can add. Okay. So that's sort of nice to know. There's um, other things, other common controls as they have here. Um, you, next, you have a label. So... This is a label right here. If you go in the upper right corner, see where it says label, okay? You can add a label by being on the insert tab um, the, or the tab slash menu at the top. And uh, if insert is selected, you'll see you can add your own label here. So I'm gonna add a label here. See this, here's a label. Uh, it just displays text. So I'm gonna remove that one. So we've got one there. And this third control that they're teaching you about on the screen is an image. So you could go up here to the top, Go up to media and add your own image if you wanted to. All right, so I'm gonna delete that. All right, so what it's wanting us to do here, it says change the fill color of this box. And we'll change the color of the box by going to this uh, property pane off here to the right. All right, so let's change this to, I don't know, to green. There we go. All right, the next step is to change the font size. All right, so let's change this to 20. There you go. Change the image on this container. It says replace the image in the Im image container with an image from your computer. Use the image property on the properties panel to your right. So here's the image. If you click on it, you'll see what the image is up here in the expression bar. Or in this case, you could just use this little drop down and we can change it to something that we have here. There we go. So we change it to uh, an image that was already uploaded into this Power Apps application. Um, 
And it looks like we can actually add it from this dropdown, add an image file. All right, now that since we've changed those three properties of the th these three different controls, we now have a next button. Now we can either hit F5 or we can just hold down the Alt key on our keyboard and just click next. All right, so lesson four is gonna teach you a little bit about uh, event type properties of controls. And it's also gonna uh, teach you about navigate. All right, so let's talk about the event properties. So we've got a button selected here. We click on it. You'll notice all these different properties that we could change or interact with here on the side in this dropdown. So for example, fill, we changed the fill or the background color of a rectangle before. So we could change this to something different. We could say mm, green if we wanted to, right? But the point they're trying to make here is that with all these properties, there are some of them that are actually events. And what they're saying is, if there are event properties, there's there'll probably be prefix with the on prefix. So let's go down here and look for on. So there's one one property that starts with on and it's on select. So that makes sense. So I'm gonna click on that. And um, so we'll go up here and we can actually type something in here. So what it's, what it's telling us is this button currently doesn't work. So if we hit uh, run, Click on the button. So the buttons on the previous lesson screens actually did work, and this one does not. Now what they want you to do is use a function here called navigate. Okay, and whenever you use a function uh, within Power Apps, you always want to use parentheses, and that's pretty standard in programming languages. If you call a function, you call a routine, you're going to use pr uh, parentheses because a lot of times you need to pass arguments or parameters into that function. And whatever is between the opening and closing parentheses is actually the argument or the parameter. So in this case, it wants us to pass in the name of a screen that we should navigate to. So use the navigate function to move from screen to screen. So in this case, it wants us to go to L05 for lesson 05 formulas. So let's type that, capital L, and now Power Apps is case sensitive, so if it actually wants you to type capital L, you should make that capital. If you don't make it capital, you can just keep typing 05. You'll see here that it actually gives you suggestions. Uh, a lot of times us programmers will call that uh, IntelliSense. So in this case, if I were just to hit tab, it will select the topmost item. There you go. And you see it capitalized that L. So that's useful to know. So that's what they're looking for us to do. Now we could just run this, hit the button and move on to the next lesson. However, I'd like to show you something in addition to this that involves navigation. So let's add a new button here. So I'll click on insert, click on button, and I'll put this button right here beside the other one. And I'm gonna change the fill by going over to color. As you can see within Power Apps, there's multiple ways of doing the same thing. So I could go over here. Now color typically is the foreground color and fill is the bag. So also, if you're looking for something specific, you can just type it in here, fill, okay? And you can see if I hover over this, it's giving me the RGBA um, values to make up that color, or we'll just type in something here, like gray. All right, so this button right here, we can change a property for the text. Call this less than back. So I hit enter and you notice it does something that looks like a little like a back arrow. So that's why I did that. And you notice the next has two forward arrows or greater than symbols there. I mean, we could add another one in there to make it consistent with the other button. Okay, so we did that. Now, uh, remember, as I was about to show you the changing the fill the property over here, we could have changed it right here and just selected something. Or maybe we don't like the shade of gray that is gray just by typing in the word gray. So if we were to select a different shade of gray, it will actually put those those values, the RGBA values in there for us. And uh, so R is red, G is green, and B is for blue. So it mixes those three colors. The A is uh, for alpha. So, so that will make that color uh, completely opaque or translucent, depending upon the value. For example, if I were to change that one, uh, which is a whole number, to a fraction like 50%, if I can type the percent there, um, what you'll notice is that you can start to see through it. Okay, so 
just wanted to show you that so you know what that A is for. Okay. All right. So now that we have this button here, I'm going to try to size it so it sort of looks like this other button. All right. So remember how to get to the on select property. We can either go here. We could, we could go and type on. Boom, there's on select. Hit enter. And there's nothing there. So nothing's going to happen. If I hold down alt and click on this button, nothing's going to happen. Uh, again, a second way, clicking action on select. All right. So there's another function besides navigate that will make us go to a different screen. And that is the back function. So we type capital B-A-C-K. Make sure we have the parentheses in there. Now, it really doesn't take any parameters, the back function. But because it's a function, we need to include those parameters. Okay. So if I were to hold down my alt key, and click on that, that should take us back to the previous lesson screen. You see that? So I'm still holding down the Alt key. I'm gonna click Next, now we're here. And on this Next, we do have this Navigate function already in there. So I'm gonna hold down Alt again and move on to the next lesson. All right, so lesson five is about formulas. You can read the text here on the screen. The most important thing to pick up here is this little note on the right side of the screen. It says, Power Apps formulas are declarative meaning they instruct a control to listen to changes in other controls. Here we tell the value field to look out for slider values, just like in Excel. So you may or may not be uh, familiar with Excel, uh, doing things in Excel. Uh, myself as a programmer, perhaps you're a programmer or have varying degrees of experience in programming. Um, typically, us developers, we're used to procedural driven. So if something happens, we make something happen, and then later on we could uh, change something back. Um, however, in Excel and Power Apps, it's declarative, which means here are two sliders, okay? And as you follow the instructions here, they want us to go into, this is a label. So if we click on the control, go up to the upper right corner, we'll see that it is a label. And they want to teach us about this formula bar, this expression bar here at the top. Um, you could call this the coding window. If there's any code in your application, you're going to be going back to this window to add the code in here. And if you need more space, you can make it larger. I like to make it larger and then just collapse expand and collapse from there with this uh, chevron in the upper right corner. So we're going to get very familiar with this on this particular lesson. We're going to add an expression here that's going to reference the values of these two slider controls here in the middle of the screen. And no matter how they change, how many times they change, the expression that we tie to the text value of this label will constantly change. As it says over on the right side, it's going to listen to the changes in the other controls. So uh, let's talk a little bit about controls in general. So they named this slider here price, just the word price, which I don't recommend. Um, whenever you name your controls, I would highly recommend that you give it a prefix. So for example, for this price, um, for, for a slider, I would say SLD, okay, and then there's quantity. I recommend just clicking on the name and then you can go in here and SLD slider. For labels, I wouldn't call it total, I would call it LBL. LBL would be short for label. And when you do that, it's obvious when you when you create some code or an expression up here in the expression bar that when you're looking for a slider, so we click on this, we can either go find text in this drop down or go or just click on the word of text over here. That's what I typically do. I think it's the fastest. So here's the expression. Right now it just has a, a literal a zero value there, okay, for the text. So if you want to reference a slider uh, in your application somewhere and get the value of it, all you have to do now, since we've named our controls, our, our slider controls, the SLD, we'll see a list of all of our sliders here. Isn't that neat? So that's what I recommend doing. So the first one is price. So um, the, the, the very first item is the one that I want. So I'm going to hit tab and it's going to type that in there for me. And they want us to take the price. But uh, in order to get a, at the value of the control. So right now we just typed in, we, we have the name of the control in the expression bar. But we're not referencing the value yet. So we have to do dot. And you'll see all the properties when you hit dot. And then IntelliSense here listed below. Value is what we're trying to get at. If you look in the right pane here, it's telling us price dot value uh, multiplied by quantity dot value. So we need to, the value is the, the one we're looking for. So I'm going to hit tab. 
We're going to use the star or the asterisk or the multiplication uh, operator. And now we'll reference the quantity slider. So SLD, I didn't type that right, SLD, quantity. Now you notice quantity um, isn't the first one, it's the one that we want, but it almost looks like it's selected, because probably because my, my cursor's over it. Instead of hitting tab, tab will always give you the first one, but if you select the one that you want, um, you just hit enter and it should give you that. Typically it does, SLD. So um, if you were to use the down arrow, arrow and hit enter, there you go. So SLD qu uh, quantity, that's the control itself. So if you want to get at the value of it, and something you should also notice in the middle of the screen, these controls are selected in green and purple. So it's, it's trying to show you, it's trying to help you see what it is in your expression up here in the, the coding window that we're looking at here, what it's referencing. Okay, so you notice SLD price is highlighted in green and the SLD quantity is highlighted in pink or purple. Okay, so it's sort of a helpful thing within Power Apps. So I'm gonna reference the value property. Now different controls have different properties. So if I'm trying to get at um, uh, the, the, the text in a label or a text box, it wouldn't be value, it'd be like dot text. Okay, but sliders have dot values, check boxes, toggle buttons, they have values. So the more that you work with all the different types of controls, you'll get to learn what are the main properties you want to get at. Okay, so because values, what we're trying to get at is the topmost value. I'm going to hit tab. There we go. Now look at that. So we got 500 and uh, we just don't want to click on next. Now let's, let's play around with this. So you notice as it changes, it's going to automatically update this label. Okay. Hopefully that all makes sense. That's pretty much all it is for this particular lesson on this screen. So I am going to hold down the Alt key and press Next. All right, so lesson six is about the if statement or the if function. It's actually quite important, so let's dig into this. So if you read through all the text here, it's uh, going to have us change two properties of this button. Okay, so if we go over here, um, so this is the Submit button. Again, if, if this was my project, what I would recommend doing is actually giving this a meaningful name like BTN for button submit. And it wants us to change the text property of this button based on the value of this discount slider here. All right, so how do we get to the text? So it says on select here. So instead of going there, let's go to the text. Now, again, you could pick text here. The easiest way is simply to go to this right pane for the properties and click on the word text. There we go. And it wants us to type in this expression here, this if statement. And as you can see, those parentheses, it's if, you've got parentheses. And inside those parentheses, you have three parameters. So the first value in an if statement is going to be an expression that evaluates to true or false. Okay, so if we look at their expression here in the right side, it says if discount.value. So I'm imagining a slider control is called discount, and it is. So if discount.value is greater than 20, the greater than or less than operator, also an, an equals operator, will give you either a true or false value, which is what you need in an if statement. So the very first parameter, you could type in true or false, but what, what would be the use in that? You need something dynamic in there that's, that's based on variables or um, uh, an equation. The value of the discount slider is either going to be greater than 20 or it's not. It's going to be either true or false. Now, if it's true, this expression is going to return the, the text request approval. And if this first parameter is false, if it's not over 20, the text that's going to be returned is submit order. Okay, so let's do that. Let's click on this uh, button. We'll click on that word text here. We're going to go up here instead of being a, what I would call a string literal for this text property, this button. We're going to put in here an if statement. So I'm going to move this. We actually need that string there, so I don't have to type it in again. So we'll do an if. And of course, we need an ending parenthesis, beginning and ending parenthesis, if we call a function or, uh, within Power Apps here. So the first thing here is discount uh, dot value greater than 20, comma. Need those commas to separate the parameters or the arguments into a function. And uh, the true part is going to be request 
approval. Then we need another comma. So separate the second and the third parameter. And there we go. All right, let's try this out. Let's hit the play button. And let's move this slider around a little bit. So when it hits the 20, I'm sorry, over 20, when it becomes greater than 20, see if it's just at 20. If it's 20, it's not over 20, right? So anything all the way up until 20, um, it's going to be one thing. It's going to be submit order. And then if it's anything over, she says request approval. So the, sec the second step of this lesson is to actually change the fill, the background color of this button based on this value as well. So let's save ourselves some time by copying what we had. So we're going to click on the button, click on text. There's our if expression, our if function that we call with three parameters. And let's go to the fill, the background for this button. Oops, I just clicked on the wrong thing. There we go. <clears throat> so it's gray right now. We're going to paste this in. And of course, we're going to have an error because what this if a function is returning is actually text and we actually need to return a color. So instead of request approval, we're going to put the word red in there. And that word red in Power Apps evaluates to a special color value than Power Apps. And then here, uh, we'll just say gray. Okay, I'm going to run it and move this thing around. So 20 and below, it's going to be gray, it's mid order. Anything over 20, it's going to be request approval and it's going to be in red. So hopefully that makes it clear how to use the if statement. You'll be using it a lot as you build your own Power Apps. So this is definitely one to keep in, keep in mind. All right, so lesson seven is about variables. Variables is very important. And um, I'm actually going to add in a little bit of material here, some, some concepts that they don't show you that I think is important that you should know. Um, if you go through this, it's going to tell you several things. Number one is they recommend naming your variables with an underscore. What I've seen in the industry for Power Apps, people name their variables with a prefix VAR, short for variable. And... Uh, there's another way to use uh, variables, and that is to use a context variable. All right, so a context variable is something that I'll get to in a moment, but let's just focus on just regular variables, also known as global variables. If you declare a variable, it's going to be uh, referenced or could uh, can be referenced throughout the whole application. Thus, why typically it's called a global variable. Okay, so something I want to show you before we get into this any further um, is you click on the file pull down menu and you'll see an item down here called variables. And uh, so at the very top, you'll see global and it will list out all the variables that are used in this application. So we're about to use this a variable here called underscore my variable. <clears throat> and you see that it has a value of one right now for me. Okay, so it is set in two places. One for the um, the on visible for the screen. It's uh, so screens have events like on visible, on hidden, and then we also have uh, an icon that sets it up as well. So if we do want to change the name of this variable, you have to change it in this set. So essentially, how you create a variable is you use a function called set. Simply set the name of the variable that you want to use comma, and the second parameter is the value that you want to put into that variable. So let's get back to the screen here. All right, so we'll follow their steps on the side here. Number one is set the on select action of icon add one. So I believe this icon right here, yeah, it's called icon add one. I typically prefix my icons. I'm glad to see that they use some type of a prefix here, but I typically use ICO. That's what I see in the industry. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and leave it as, as icon add one. That's fine. They want us to go into the on select. So right now, you see this little drop down. It already has on select selected, so we don't need to go up to action. Okay, and we'll actually use that set function to set a variable. So the first time you use set, it sort of creates the variable. The first time you use the set, and any subsequent times, any other places in your application is actually going to. Um, put a value in there, as well as the first time, of course. But um, if you have no sets, then that variable doesn't exist. So here we'll say, um, we'll use underscore. 
Um, again, I, I, I create all my, my variable names, like a, a global variable, like we're using here with the set keyword. I just use VAR, but we're just going to keep it consistent with what they have here and, and use the underscore. So it looks like my variable is, is right there. It's not the top one, so I'm not going to hit tab. I'm just going to click on it, my variable. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the, the current value of my variable. Okay. And we're going to add one to it. Okay. And step number two, set the on select action of the subtract one. So we're going to do something similar to save ourselves some time. I'm going to click on that icon that we're just on and on the on select, I'm going to copy that code. I'm going to click on that downward arrow icon and on select is selected here in this drop down. So I'm going to go in and just paste that in. And instead of the plus one, I'm going to say minus one. Okay, step three, play your app and test. To complete this exercise, use up icon to increase the numbers, increase the number of goodies. Let's do that. Hit play. There we go. Of course, my icon is very big. It sort of covers up the text box. But uh, there you go. And if I click on the downward, it's going to decrease. Now, what happens if I keep clicking on this? It's going to go down to the negative. Well, um, we may not want that to happen, right? So let's get out of this and let's look what else they have here. Um, a bonus challenge, make the subtract button disappear when the value has reached zero. Uh, using the if function that we used, that we used in the, uh, the previous lesson in the visible property. So you can make something appear or disappear by changing the visible property. So if we go down to visible for this icon, you said it's set to true. If you can see it on the screen, generally it's gonna be true. Unless you have an expression, a dynamic expression here. So let's say, let's use a an if statement, um, if, and we'll say that variable, my variable, as long as that is greater than zero, we'll say true, otherwise false. Okay, so let's test this out. That's what they wanted us to do, to use that if that if function. So it's negative nine. So if we had done this before, it would have never gotten to a negative number. So in this application, the business requirements say there shouldn't be a number, a negative number of goodies, okay? So we see that that works. Now, let me just sort of show you um, a, a programmer's way of looking at this particular problem. So this item here, already returns a true or false value. And uh, because we're returning a true and a false here, this if function is gonna return a true or false, false value of, obviously, of course, as you can see there, right? Well, that really isn't necessary. So the visible property is a true or false or a Boolean, as programmers call that a Boolean value. We could just get rid of all this stuff and just have this Boolean evaluated expression here. And it would work exactly the same way. So if I run this to test that, it's good to um, exercise or to practice what you've learned. So it's good that we use the if function again, but you don't always have to use an if, uh, especially if it's going to evaluate true, true or false anyway. Okay. So uh, let's look at this little reset icon. What, what goes on here? So this is going to reset it to one. As you see, they're using the set function. They're going to set that to one. Okay. And just to show you, uh, this screen has an on visible and on hidden. So this is code that is going to occur whenever the screen shows up and when it disappears. Okay, so if I click on that, you see that it initializes that variable to one. So let's click on this button and see that. There we go. It's one. We change it. Click on it, it's gonna set it back to one. So variables are very useful. You'll be using them a lot as you write applications. So um, there is another concept called context variables. Now a regular variable that you create when you use the set function is what's called a global variable. You can reference that variable all throughout your application. If you want a variable to be, let's say a separate copy uh, on one screen, then an, uh, then another screen, use a context variable and you don't use the set keyword. Let me create a button here. Let's, let's insert a button. And what we'll do here is um, for the on select. So for this button, let's give it uh, some button text over here. So 
click on text, go in here and type um, update context. That's what I'll be called. Let's make it a little bigger. And uh, in order to create a context variable on the onSelect event, we're going to call the function update context. Okay. And this is used a little differently than the set keyword. So inside of a parentheses, we're going to have curly braces. This looks a little weird, but so I actually create all my context variables with this underscore, but I'm actually going to make it very obvious as context variable. I'm going to say CTX variable. And let's take the value of it and add one to it. Okay. Now, what the main difference is between a context variable and a regular variable. Regular variable is global. Once you declare it or set it, it can be accessed throughout the whole application. Now, a context variable, once you use it within a screen, it can only be used within that screen. And if you use the same context variable name in another screen, those two variables are going to be completely separate. In the programming world, it's actually called scope. So the scope for a regular variable in Power Apps is global. The scope for a context variable is a screen. All right, now that we have a button added to the screen that is using a context variable, and we're updating it, we're incrementing the number by one, let's add a label to actually display what's going on with that context variable. So I'm going to go up to the top and say insert label. And we'll drag this thing down here. And... Down here, I'm going to type an underscore, and there's our context variable at the very top. I'm going to hit tab, and it's just going to display whatever is in that variable. Now, right now, you don't see anything because it hasn't. this button hasn't been clicked on yet, and that's the only place where we're actually using that context variable. So it really hasn't been initialized yet. So um, something I'd like to also do is give a border to this uh, label because if it doesn't have any value in it, uh, you're not going to be able to see it, and you might want to click on it. But um, So anyway, let's hold down the Alt key on the keyboard, click the button, and there we go. There's one, two, three, four, five. Very good. All right, so let's do something else here. Um, let's select the button, select the label, hit Control-C on the keyboard to copy, hit Control-V on the keyboard to paste. Okay, and up here, I'm going to do something similar, but this time I'm going to say... Uh, um, Use set. Okay, use it set. And for this variable, we're actually going to use a set like we did above on this same screen here. And I'm going to use var. That's what I typically uh, prefix all my global variables with var. And we'll say new variable. And uh, what we'll do is we'll take the name of that variable, we'll take it, and we'll add one to it. Okay. And uh, I'm going to go over to this label. Instead of using the context variable, I'm going to paste that name of that new variable I created. I'm going to hold down Alt on the keyboard. I'm going to click on that button. There's one. Okay. So I did this side by side to prove a point or to, to demonstrate something. So if I click on all four of these, I hit Control C on my keyboard. Let's go back to our rules screen and let's paste it here on this screen. Look at that. What you will notice is that the global variable um, has been initialized. It's been initialized to 1, and I can click on it a few times until it gets up to 10. But uh, this context variable that's being um, referenced here, so if we have the label selected, if we go up to the right side of the screen and hit, click on text, we'll see that it's referencing a context variable. But because the scope of a context variable is a screen, and because we went to a different screen, on this screen it hasn't been initialized. So I'm going to hold down Alt, I'm going to click on the button, now it's 1. Okay. Now what happens if we go back to this LO7 variable screen. So we've got 10 and we have 5. Go back to the rules, there's 10 and there's 1. So context variable on each screen has its own value, but a global is global throughout the application. So I just want to take my time just to sort of explain that. Um, 
So there's two ways to create variables, either a set global or using the update context for a uh, context variable in which the scope is only a screen. But that's it. That's variables. On to the next lesson. All right. Lesson eight, the camera. So the camera portion of Power Apps is a lot more exciting if you're creating a mobile app. But let's set this up here in the browser so we can actually use this feature. So up here in the browser, so I'm using Microsoft Edge. And I see a little video uh, icon here. This page has been blocked from using your camera. So I'm gonna click on it. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna click on the option, always allow make.powerapps.com to access your camera. And I'm gonna click done. And there I am. Hello. <laughs> yeah, so I use a camera, a good video camera to record these videos. And I also have a web camera. So there you go. Uh, we're here in run mode. I'm gonna click on the X. Get back into design mode. What does it say? It says to go to the the camera control, edit its on select property. So I'll click on it again to make sure I have the um, the control selected. I'll go up to action and then click on the on select. There we go. It says false, and it wants us to set obviously set up a variable here. So picture, and we'll say camera. One, so down arrow to the, you find the item that I want and hit enter, camera one, dot photo, ending parenthesis. So this will copy the current image captured by the camera into the picture variable every time the camera is clicked on. The image container is set to show the contents of the picture. Play and click on the camera image to capture the photograph. So I'm going to hit run. I'll click on this. There we go. Let's do a better one. <laughs> How do you like that? All right, so the next lesson is publishing your application. Something that we should talk about before we discuss publishing your application is actually saving your application. Whenever you create a new application, even from a template like this, I would actually recommend that you save it right away. So let's do so now. We'll click on file. We'll hit save. Um, now, I've actually already done this. Um, the first time that you save, it's going to ask you to give it a name. Um, so in this case, I, I called it Power Apps Training 01234 uh, to make sure it's unique within my environment. Power Apps will actually automatically save your application every two minutes. In fact, if you go into settings for your project, so I'm here on safe. If I click on settings here, there's actually a setting that we can change. If we scroll down, you can see auto save. Save changes every two minutes. This is a browser level setting and it's defaulted to be on. However, if you never do an initial save, Power Apps doesn't have a name to, to use to save it to your environment. So it's actually really important that you do this early on so you've got a good history of saves. All right, so here we are in the application. Now you can always go to the file, pull down menu, and click on save here. And once it saves, you'll get an option to publish. Beside the publish button, you've got to see all versions. If you click on that, you're going to see a listing of all the different versions that have been saved. And the very first version is live or as published. So somebody, if you were to share this with someone, um, they would see this very, uh, the, the latest version that actually has this live beside it. Now, if we go back and we click on publish, it says publishing will make this version available to everyone who has can use permission. So I'm going to click on publish. And now I can click on see all versions and we'll probably see something different here. As you can see, the very latest version has live. Now, something they don't mention here within this lesson screen is the idea of sharing it with people within your organization. Let me show you that. So if I go down to the file pull down menu and go to share, brings up a new browser tab and we'll see that uh, I'm the owner. A lot of times what I like to do is actually share with everyone within the organization. And then um, so that will keep me from having to type in, let's say there's 20 people that I know need to use it, or it might be 200. Instead of typing everyone's name here, I just type in everyone. And then within the, the application, if there's a people that shouldn't be able to access it based on some role or, or anything, I actually handle that within the application. So to share this, 
Uh, a lot of times, if you want to share it with everybody in the organization, um, if you have hundreds or thousands, you, you probably don't want to email everybody. So I would recommend unchecking that for the most part. And then uh, just clicking share. You need to make sure they have access to uh, the data sources that the application uses. So I'll go ahead and click share. There we go. Now, if you click on this left side of the screen, you can actually get at the link that you can send somebody. So since you've shared it with everybody, if you send this link to somebody in your organization, they should be able to click on it and get your application. Just keep in mind that they're going to see the last published version of your application, not the last saved version, unless they're the same. All right, let's go ahead and uh, hold down the Alt key on the keyboard and click Next. We will go on to the next lesson, which is about publishing to mobile devices. So if you just send someone this link, chances are they're just going to be bringing it up inside of a browser window. However, if you want to have the user use this from their mobile device, a phone or a tablet, what you need to do is go to the Google Play Store or the iOS Store and download the Microsoft Power Apps application. After you install the Microsoft Power Apps application and you sign into your Office 365 environment, you'll be able to see all the applications that you've created or that have been shared with you. All right, so time to move on to lesson number 11. So I'm going to hold down Alt and click on the next button here. And that will take us to the next screen, the next lesson, Gallery Basics. Galleries are huge within Power Apps. It's a repeater control. So you connect to a data source and whatever controls you put in the very first record at the top of a gallery will be repeated over and over for each and every record that that data source has that you've connected to. Many times, if you want to display more than one record at a time, the gallery is and probably should be your go-to control while doing so. At the very beginning, when we created this project, Power Apps asked us to make this app our own by creating a spreadsheet in our OneDrive or a Google Drive. So within your online storage, like OneDrive, there's a folder called Power Apps, and within that folder, there's another folder called Templates. And you'll find a, another folder for the project. If you go in there, you'll see the Excel spreadsheet. Let's go there now. All right, so if you open up the spreadsheet, you'll see we'll have two tabs at the bottom, contacts and accounts. So the template doesn't uh, show you this. It just mentions, hey, there's a data source. Connect the gallery to the data source. But I wanted to show you where this is at, what this looks like in Excel, so you know. Let's go back to Power Apps. So over on the right pane, it actually tells us to select the gallery. So there's a little trick about the gallery. If you just click on it, you click near the top, you're going to select the first record within the gallery, which you don't necessarily want to do. If, um, if you want, actually want to select the gallery itself, click on the middle or somewhere after that first, and you'll select the gallery itself. Otherwise, you can go over on the left side. This is called the tree view. You've got all the, the screens and all the controls. So you can actually cl just click on the gallery itself. And then everything that you see within a gallery here on the left side, these are all the items that are sitting in this uh, the first record of a gallery that I had mentioned before. So whatever you put in the first record will be repeated. So you'll see each of these. So there's four items there. So they want us to click on the gallery itself. So we'll do that. And it said to set the items property of gallery one. So this is gallery one to contacts. So if you click on the word data source, you're going to bring up the expression bar here at the top, or you can just select the data source from the drop down list here. So let's just go ahead and click contacts. There we go. And there we go. So now we have contacts popping up here. Now I notice there's an error. So let's, let's see what's going on there. So if you ever see an error within Power Apps, you see this little red X, you see a little downward chevron. So if you click on edit in the formula bar, it says this.sample image. Okay. So <laughs> what we have here is an image uh, in the gallery. And uh, over here in this spreadsheet, there's no image column. So that's what's going on. That's why it's giving us an error. And I'm looking here on the screen. It says explore the gallery, how the gallery works by scrolling through the available records. I mean, we could just, um, yeah, what would be a good idea is just to keep it a sample image. So if you ever see the uh, keyword, this item within Power Apps, that is a reference to the currently selected record within the gallery. Okay. So I don't want anything from the current row being displayed for the image because there's no image in the spreadsheet. So I'm just going to take out this item dot 
and we'll use sample image. Sample image is a reserve keyword within Power Apps, and within Power Apps it actually has this sample image that you can use. Okay, so we'll leave it as that. So they don't even they don't even talk about how to deal with the error that the error would pop up. So that's what I'm here for, right? <laughs> All right. So it says explore how the gallery works by scrolling through the available records. So let's run it, and we've got a little scroll bar here. So so for each of the rows that we have over here in contacts, we have a little record within the gallery. So if this was a real application, I probably wouldn't put the button right there. I'd probably move the button around or maybe move it to the, the very bottom. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the gallery and actually make it taller. There we go. And uh, we could make, we can sort of move things around. We can make this image smaller. Move it around here. Okay. Now, if you click on the first row by not selecting any controls in there, just select maybe on a like the white space, you'll see that it selects the, the whole first record space. And you just make that a little bit more narrow so you can see more at once. Now we'll run it. And this is starting to look more like a, a usable gallery. All right, so let's move on to the next lesson. We'll hold down the Alt key and click on the Next button. All right, Lesson 12, Gallery Templates. So let's just follow the instructions here on the right side. It's going to show us a few more things about uh, galleries. Connect the gallery to the data source contacts, like we did before. So we'll click on this drop down, select Contacts. Number two, using the Properties panel, select the Title and Subtitle Layout instead of Blank. So you see this layout here? So we click on this little blank and they want us to select title and subtitle. So we'll click on that. Now, something that's become obvious to me as I was stepping through this is you don't see anything in this gallery. And uh, this is really unfortunate because this template was made for beginners to go through all the basics. And I'm sitting here as I was stepping through these, the steps that are outlined on the screen. Why is it that I can't see the, the data? I mean, we've connected to the contacts just like we did in the previous screen. So um, within Power Apps, as you put controls and things on a screen, um, things can be on top of each other. Okay, so over here in the tree view on the left side here, we see Gallery 2, and that's what we're working with here. What we need to do is click on these three dots, do a reorder, bring it to the front. Look at that. Now we can see it. Now that we have that straightened out, let's get back to the directions here. So using the property panel, select the title and subtitle layout instead of blank. So it wasn't blank, but we're going to select title and subtitle. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> and moves it to the back again. Let's do this again. So by the way, I, I don't use templates. So this particular lesson is about templates. I never use templates within the galleries. Uh, let me show you what I do. When I want to use a gallery, um, I'm going to pick either between a, a uh, blink vertical or a blink horizontal. Blink vertical is probably what you use most of the time, 90, 95% of the time. Um, and then if, if you want like repeating tabs or things to repeat horizontal, you might use this. But Blink Vertical is the one that I would recommend to use almost all the time. But uh, in the interest of just sort of keeping with the plan, keeping with this template, let's just power through this. OK, shall we? <laughs> all right. So we have the gallery at the top. And uh, all right. So in the same panel, connect the subtitle label to company field. So this is the... Um, the subtitle, as you can see here in the gallery, there is a label called subtitle three. So we are going to connect that to company. So instead of business phone up here at the top, now this label, you can go over here, you can go to the top and change it there, or you can go over and click text and that will bring it up here. Okay. So let's just type in company. There we go. And they want title be changed to a uh, full name. So click on title and I've got full name there. All right. Edit the gallery template to set the title text color to red. So there's the title, the text color over here, color, or we just click on this, select a red color that we like. Very good. Remove the Chevron icon from the template. So they want us to remove this. So you click on it and click delete. All right, I'm going to hit Control-S on the keyboard to save progress. 
yeah, this, this lesson teaches you about uh, templates within galleries. I wouldn't recommend using it, but at, at least we got through it, right? <laughs> All right, so I'm going to hold down Alt and click on the next uh, button. All right, lesson 13 is continuing the lesson in uh, using the gallery. So it's going to teach us here about the selected record within the gallery. There is a checked image in the bottom left corner of the screen. Select it and use Control X to cut it in the clipboard. So it's referring to this little check mark here. And if you look at it, it is an image. Okay, so it wants us to cut that. And then it wants us to select the first record of the gallery. That's step two. Select the first row and paste the image with Control V into the template. You should see the image repeated for all the records. So. Um, I'm just going to hit control B to paste. There it is. It's, a, it's visible for all the records here. Edit the visible property of your pasted image and enter. Okay. So we'll go down to go down here, find the visible. And so what it want, wants us to do this item again, the keyword, this item refers to the uh, current, uh, record within a gallery and we'll say is selected. Is selected is a property that's gonna return either true or false based on if it's selected or not. So right here we can see that the first row is selected. Step four, play your app and verify how clicking the records selects them. Explore the text property of the label select a person. I assume that's this down here. Yeah, label select a person. To see how the gallery dot selected allows you to access the selected records properties from the outside of a gallery. So if you look at this label here, if you click on text, it's going to bring up this expression here at the top, the phone number of it refers to this gallery. You see it's, it has a, uh, a green outline here because we clicked on it here dot selected. So dot selected is going to be. Uh, it returns a record, and that record happens to be whichever one is currently selected. You can only have one item in a gallery selected. And uh, by default, if let's say a gallery was here and it's got data in it and a user opens up a screen with a gallery, uh, by default, the very first row is going to be the one that's selected. There always has to be one row within a gallery um, to be selected. Okay, so And it's going to access a property full name out of that record from the data source. And we're splicing together strings. It's saying the phone number of Alex Simmons, the currently selected person, is, and it goes to the gallery, goes to the selected row, and pulls up the business phone. Okay. So let's go ahead and run it. And as they said, click on the different uh, on the different rows there. Okay. And uh, step five is when we get to the Allison Brown. Um, I guess that's. The, the visible property that button is tied to this Allison Brown being selected. So we'll go ahead and click on that. All right. So lesson 14 covers filtering. This is some good stuff here. So there's a function within Power Apps called a filter and you pass in to it a data source. In this case, we've uh, let's click on the gallery here and we'll see it's contacts. If I click on data source, it just says contacts here. So it says, and the item is property the gallery for, which is what I'm currently am. So whenever you're working with a data source and it, um, you're looking for items, see that it says items here. It's the same thing as data source. If you click on it, you don't see item here. It's, it's called data source over here. So those things can be used interchangeably. That might be a little confusing, but that's what's going on. So what it's telling us to do is use the filter function. Okay. So there are two parameters to use filter. So we'll type in filter, use an open parenthesis. And then, uh, so that's, that's the first parameter, the data source. The second uh, parameter is the, uh, the criteria that will actually filter the result set. Okay. So um, if you have a, a data source with rows in it, if you filter it, you're going to get a subset of rows within the full um, uh, listing of those rows. Okay, so as it's telling us to do, we name off country. Now that is a column within the Excel spreadsheet, or if this was a database table, this would be a field within the database table. And we're going to say where that row, I'm sorry, where that column or field equals Canada. Okay, there we go. And you see we have a subset. All right. 
And that's it. That's how you use filter. Let's move on to the next lesson. All right. Lesson 15 is sorting and nesting. So let's just cover the sorting right now. So you've got a gallery here and you can sort a result set just by calling the function sort. That's the first parameter, just sort of like filter was. You have the first parameter, which is the data source. Second parameter would be the column name that you want to sort on. So that could be, well, let's go over here and look at the, the, the data stuff here. So full name, let's sort on full name. So you can do that. Okay. And whenever you change that, it takes a, a second or two for it to actually show up, just to let you know that. Um, so let's look at what they have here. So in the previous lesson, we covered filter, or th that was the, the lesson 14 within this template, was filtering. OK, so I wanted to show you the sort because that's the new concept on this lesson. But we could go in here and you can nest these functions over and over and over again. So um, just like the, the previous lesson, we're going to filter. But instead of uh, trying to filter down to just Canadians, we're going to filter on contacts within uh, the, the USA. OK. Country equals USA. Okay. And uh, so it's filtering and then it's sorting. So it actually processes things from the most internal and then it, it, uh, it calls the functions as it goes out, if that makes sense. So looking at this example, it's going to filter. And it's going to take that and then pass that into sort. And then it's going to return that result set to this gallery and display it. All right, so now modify the items property again to sort the output filter by city. So instead of full name, let's, um, okay, city, not by full name. So we're actually going to sort by this city. Now there's an optional third parameter for sort. The default is ascending, so a lot of times people don't include that. Uh, but if you wanted to sort descendingly, um, you would actually be sure that you included it. Okay, so that's step number two. As you edit the formula, the assignment of labels and fields might get lost. Yeah, so if you're modifying this, you're going to see all kinds of errors inside the gallery, just to let you know. That's, that's very common. So that's it. So we've learned how to sort. In the previous lesson, we took filtering, we combined them and nested them here in this lesson. All right, so on to lesson number 16. We'll click next now. All right, lesson 16 covers drop down lists. So, a drop down list uh, is something that has a data source like the gallery, has a uh, listing of records, but um, it's only going to select, it's only going to display one at a time. So, if I hold down Alt, click on the little chevron, you see in this particular case, there's three records. And if we actually look at the items, it says drop down sample. So that is a keyword within um, Power Apps that you can use for a list. If you just want a sample, you could use that. But here it's actually telling us to connect to accounts. So we'll type in accounts. There we go. And if I hold on Alt, you'll see. There we go. So let's go over to the spreadsheet in this other tab. So. Uh, there's two tabs here. There's contacts and accounts. So click on accounts. So you'll see here, it's actually pulling up the city and they might want the name uh, or the primary contact. Let's go back here and check that. It said, uh, use the advanced panel to select name as the column to be displayed. So instead of city, we'll select name. Very good. Select Microsoft in the drop, uh, in the drop down to complete the exercise. All right, so I'm gonna select Microsoft lesson 17. So we are looking at linking controls here, or better put, we are going to filter this gallery here in the middle of the screen based on what the user selects in this dropdown here. So if we open this up, it's got a list of uh, cities. Um, if you go up here to items or click on items over here, I'll bring it up. It uses a function here and it, it talks about it here on the right pane. Uh, the distinct function um, looks, it takes a data source. It's, it's sort of like um, uh, the sort function. It takes a data source and the second parameter is a, a field or a column within a data source. So let's take a look at that. 
contacts. So it's looking at this data right here. It's looking in the city column and it's going to return all the distinct values. So let's say if Dallas was in here four or five times, it's only going to return Dallas once. That's what distinct does. Um, and distinct um, uh, is just going to give us one of each of them. Okay, so you can see that here. Now it's not sorted, is it? <laughs> so what could we do here? This isn't a part of the lesson, but let's throw this in here. Sort. <clears throat> now distinct doesn't give you the full data, uh, the underlying data. Okay, it sort of transforms it and it's, it's just values or uh, I think it's actually results. So let's say result. There you go. So you can wrap sort around there and now you can see it's sorted. So that's a bonus. No extra charge for that. <laughs> so we have the gallery here and what it's telling us to do in the items property, it's right here, contacts. So we're gonna filter this based on what they've selected here. So I'm gonna type in filter. <clears throat> There's the data source and this is the criteria. So where, if I, if I can type right here, city, the column city equals drop down city the name of our dropdown dot selected text dot value there we go so Bogota there's only three rows or records here that match up with Bogota so once this explores we can see that if we change the the city here it changes the records that are being displayed over here we've completed this lesson let's click next all right, so lesson 18 covers searching. And searching is a lot like filtering. You're uh, slimming down the result set, the amount of rows that are coming back. But search is a little more surgical in the results it's looking for. So for example here, they're gonna have you type in a name or a city and they're, it's gonna pull back a matching result set. All right, so they want us to click on this gallery here, go up to the items or the data source and we will call the search function. So we'll use an open, opening parenthesis and ending parenthesis. So contacts, the data source is the first parameter. And then the second parameter is what we're searching for. So whatever a user types into that text box is what we're searching for. So the name of the text box is text search dot text. And then the third parameter, now look at this, as you're calling a function, do you see this little information here at the top? The first parameter was source, second one is text that you're searching for. And then the third parameter is the column, okay? So looking at, at their instructions over here, they want you to in, include the field names inside of double quotes, okay? So we're actually gonna be searching within multiple columns. So type in full name and you just continue to pass in more and more columns. But in this case, in this example, we're just searching within two columns. So whatever they type in to that little text box, it's going to search in these two columns. So full name, and then it's also going to look in city. There you go. Now, if we run this, uh, if there's nothing in there, obviously it's going to return everything. So let's see, uh, there's Andrew here. Let's type in Andrew. Okay, so just typing in A and D, we have Andrew down here. We have uh, Andy and Chan. So um, it's not doing like a starts with. It's actually searching inside of, of all the content there. All right, so it's saying enter Dallas in the search box to verify your newly built search function and to complete this exercise. So Dallas, and there we go. Let's click on next. Lesson 19 teaches collections. Um, I actually like their description so much on this particular lesson screen, I'm gonna read it out loud. Collections, collections are lists of records created on the fly. They are like variables for data sources. Records placed in the collection will be lost when your app is closed, unless you save them to some other data source. Collections are often used for temporary storage. That is photographs taken by the user, shopping carts, etc. Since you can save collections to local storage on your device, they can also help in simple office usage scenarios. Okay, so what they're attempting to have us do here 
is um, if we click on this first gallery, it looks at the uh, contacts. Again, it's this tab here, contacts. It's got all that data there. And um, it wants us to add an icon here. And whenever they click on the icon, it's going to add that particular row, whichever one we click on, it's going to add it to um, this collection variable that will hold individual records from this uh, data source. And then we're going to go over here to this gallery and it's set to look at contacts now, but we're actually going to set this up to look at that collection. Okay, so let's just go uh, down the steps here. Insert plus icon into the template. So whenever you want to insert an item into a gallery, uh, what I've learned is it's important that you actually click on one of the controls already inside that gallery. Sometimes you try to uh, add something. Let's say here's an add icon. If you don't do that, sometimes it'll actually in insert the control outside the gallery and it's frustrating. So that's a little trick that I've learned. So here's a little plus and uh, let's make it a little smaller. Let's make it 30 by 30. So I just went over here, set the width and the height. There we go. All right. So it said, so it says replace on select formula for your icons. So let's go over to action on select. So it says uh, select parent. That's fine. Uh, you can separate different lines of code within the expression bar using a semicolon. So I'm going to keep that select parent. And it wants me to use this collect function. Collect is going to take an item and throw it into a variable name of type collection. So we need to use the variable my collection. And we'll say this item. Now, if you remember, this item is something we've worked with a lot uh, in this uh, template application, that this item is whatever record inside this gallery that we're working with. Okay, so it's going to take the current record and throw it into that collection. All right, so we've done that. Uh, step number three, set items of gallery selected. So I think it's talking about this gallery here. Yeah, it's called gallery selected. And it wants us to replace contacts with my collection. There we go. So right now there are no items in that ver that collection variable. So it says, uh, step number four, note that your first collect statement for a given collection defines its type. So um, if we throw in here, this is of type contacts, you can have a button outside here that tries to add something from a different data source. So we have two data sources. We could try to throw accounts, a row of accounts in there. And uh, Power Apps would not like that because a collection can only hold one type of data source. Okay, so let's run this and see how this works. So we'll just click on this plus sign. You see that? So it's just in memory records. And that's it. So I'm going to click on next. Lesson 20 covers data tables. Now, me personally, I don't like data tables very much at all. Um, and they, they touch on the reason why you'd want to use data tables. Sometimes you need to quickly show some records on a table and don't want to spend time configuring a gallery. That pretty much spells it right there. So that's the reason why you'd ever want to use a data table. If you're taking your time and writing a, a good, solid application, um, you're never going to use a data table because um, a gallery can do almost everything that a data table can. And uh, you'll become so reliant on galleries if you ever use a data table and start to work with it like, ah, and you'll end up de deleting it and putting it in a gallery. So um, if I just need something quick, perhaps just for myself in a developer screen, I'll use a data table, but not very often will I use that. But let's go through the steps here. So select the data table. So my data table is already selected here and use the properties panel connected to the data source contacts. So I'm going to click on data source and um, <laughs> instead of this table city here, this is really strange. We're actually going to type in contacts. Contacts. There we go. I click on field zero. Okay, so we've changed that. Now I'm going to click on fields over here. It says zero select. So I'm going to click on this and it's going to show all the fields that we can select. So let's click on a, well, let's just click on them all. So as we select them, they'll start to appear over there. Uh, let's just add that and let's just be done with that. Okay. So on step two, it says try adjusting field order with drag and drop. So you can select one of these and drag it around. 
It says try. <laughs> um, <laughs> an attempt was made, okay? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you can easily change the width of, of a column here. Now, I know if you click on, the, when you're working with a data table, sometimes it's a little tricky. If you want to select the table itself here on the designer, click on one of the uh, scroll bars and you'll typically get the data table. Otherwise, go over there to the left side in the tree view and actually click on it and you'll get it. Now, if you go back to the field list, I believe you can drag these around. There you go. So perhaps that's what it meant by that. Okay. Um, well, it looks like it should work, but it's really not. So let's look at this. Nope. No. So it said to try, didn't it? <laughs> uh, select a column and use the properties panel to change the column width. Okay, so we can click on city. Um, <clears throat> And you can change some things here, but let's change it to 200. You see that that the width tried to change, <laughs> but um, all right. So we set it to 200. Now, if I click on a different field and then come back, well, let's run it. No, it does not like that. Do you see why I hate the data table? <laughs> um, uh, perhaps if, if you mess with it long enough, uh, perhaps you'll get some of these features to work. But um, uh, if you want my professional opinion, uh, it's a waste of time because you're going to be frustrated. You might as well just work with a gallery. Let's move on. All right, lesson 21, we're getting into using forms. And uh, so this particular lesson, number 21, is about display forms. Now, I recommend that you never use display forms. Okay, so if you look over here on the side of the tree view, the next lesson is edit forms. So let me just show you something here. So if you do an insert and you go over to forms, um, I have a, an aversion to using forms at all, but especially display forms, because if you add in an edit form, and you give it a back color of white, um, just a, a regular form here. You can change the default mode to view. So an edit form is much more versatile than just a view form. Um, if you add over a view a display form, that's the only thing you can do is just display the values. So anyway, let's just move on with the, the lesson and try to get out of it whatever we can here. So edit display form one, set the data source to contacts. So we're going to click on the form here. So if you don't already know this already, forms are a way to actually edit the values in a record. So we'll set the data source to contacts. There we go. And the item to gallery eight selected. So if we go over to advance and find the item, there we go. They want us to put in here gallery eight dot selected. There we go. <clears throat> in the properties panel of display form one, select the fields. Select which fields to do you want to see in the form. So we'll click on edit fields and you click on add and you can select all of them that you want. Know that the view icon in the gallery needs no special code. Just clicking on it is enough to select the current. Yeah. All right, so let's just add some of these um, fields here. Now, that's not a lot of space for a form in general, but I can uh, scroll here. So click Andrew Dixon to view his data and complete the exercise. So there he is there. All right, let's click next. Lesson 22 is edit forms. All right, so we're going to go in here, edit the edit form one. So this is the edit form one, I'm sure. So I'll, with forms, I always like to put a border around there so I know where it begins and ends. Okay, so edit the um, edit form one, set the data source to contacts. So I've been doing that a lot lately. Contacts, very good. And item to a gallery selected. So we'll go to advanced. We'll go down to item 
and we'll type in here gallery9.selected. Okay, in the properties panel of the edit form, select fields, full name and city. So we'll go over here, click on edit fields. There's city, where's full name? There it is. All right, so we selected those two. Very good. Insert an edit icon into the template. Okay, so remember my trick here. You select an item in the first record of a gallery in design mode in order to insert something in there. So an edit icon, there's an edit icon right there. So we'll click on it and it adds it. So what I like to do is go over to the size, the width and the height and set this to something like <clears throat> to 35. There we go. Replace OnStart formula for your icon with the following code to initialize the form for editing the current record. Okay, so the name of the form is Edit Form 1. I'm going to click on it, hit Control C. All right, so for the on select, I'm going to leave that code right there, that select parent. I'm going to put a semicolon in there so I can just add something to it. So we're going to do an Edit Form. There we go, and I'm going to hit Control V. That's the name of our form. Insert a save icon somewhere next to your form, and insert the following code. All right, so we are going to do an insert, and um, there's a little trick for these icons. There's a lot of icons. If you scroll up and down, uh, you know maybe there's a good one or two hundred of them. I'm just going to add an add icon. Move it to the bottom. And, uh, you know, you might want to have it on top of the form. Yeah. All right. So the trick is this. After you've added an icon, I just add an add icon because it's the very first one. And then I go over here and I do a search for the word that I'm looking for. So there's a save icon. Looks nice, huh? All right. So we're going to use a save icon. And on the on select, I'm going to say save form. There's the name of our form, edit form one. And we've got an error uh, because it's not save form, it's submit form. Submit form, there we go. All right, change the city of Alex Simmons to something else other than Redmond to complete this exercise. All right, All right let's call this uh, Springfield. Hit save, let's click next. Lesson 23 is new forms. Now, to be honest, if you're gonna use forms, you're gonna have a data entry screen. Um, you're gonna use the same form control for edits and new records. So what they're doing is they're breaking down these concepts into separate screens, but um, a lot of times you're gonna have the same form be the, you're gonna have the same form allow the entry of new records as well as the editing of the existing records. So I just wanted to point that out. But let's go through these steps. Set items of the Gallery 10 to filter where there's no country, okay? So we'll go here, we'll use the filter function like we've learned in the past. So set country to equals nothing. So what they're gonna have us do is enter some new records and we're not going to set the country, which means we're only going to see the the new ones that we're creating here on this screen. Um, I always like to put a border on a form like this, so I'll do that. All right, it wants us to set the data source to contacts. There we go. And it wants us to go into edit fields. And uh, we're looking for full name and city. And just to let you know, um, you might deal at some point in the future where there are dozens and dozens or maybe hundreds of columns. So just know that you can use this search at the top here. City, there we go. So add those two. And also know while you're using a form, you can, if, if a particular field is something like a phone number um, or uh, multi-line text you can select one of these other things here okay I just wanted to mention that I'm gonna exit out of that so we've done uh, step number two step number three we're gonna add a, a save icon 
So I'm going to add just any icon, bring it down here, go to add, type in save. We're going to find the save icon that we would like. All right. And then on the on select right here, we're going to say submit form. And the name of our form on this screen is new form one. And we're going to put a semicolon in there and then we're going to add another statement, which is reset form. And that reset form is going to get that form ready for a, a, a yet another new record. So form one. And we need to add a new record to complete this exercise. So let's say John Doe city. Uh, we'll put in here New York. Click the save button. And we're done. Let's click on next. All right, look at this. The end. Congratulations. You've completed all exercises in this app. Now go ahead and try creating an app on your own. I want to unlock access to all the exercises in this app. Okay. <laughs> so we've completed it. All right. So I, I hope that you, you've learned a lot of things by going through this training app. Uh, I think a lot of beginners, they'll open up this training app and they'll get stuck on one of these screens. So that's why I felt like the walkthrough of this tutorial uh, template was very valuable and that's why I did it. Thanks guys, bye-bye. If you found anything in this video helpful, we would really appreciate you click on that like button. If you wanna get a solid foundation on Power Apps, there are 10 things you must know. Lucky for you, my husband wrote the book. We are actually offering it for free. Click on the link below to download your free copy today. And if you wanna connect with us or work with Darren directly, visit our website, the link is below. Thanks.